writers, agents, and publishers, for the first time since the Gutenberg Press, find themselves lost in a maze of mystery as technology alters the shape of the publishing industry. Searching for Answers is a group of writers throwing pop culture, writing, and publishing into a crucible of clarity, passion, and humor. This group is the Right Pack. Welcome back to Right Pack Radio. This is your host, David Allen Lucas, author of science fiction, horror, mystery, and now president of St. Louis Writers Guild. Yay. And with me today is... Co-host Kathleen Kayembe, writer of gay romance under the pen name Kaseka and Vita, and geek about a day. Um, Melanie Kulaney, um, writer of nonfiction, science fiction, and fantasy. I'm looking at poor Kathleen, and she's like, nobody gets it. <laughs> understand we're doing, understand we are, as our audience always knows, we're recording in the future. And today, we're the, today is, in the past. today is 5, 10, 15. Oh my gosh, I love it. Jen, you can introduce yourself now. My name is Jennifer Stolzer. I'm a children's book author and illustrator. And uh, I just restocked copies of Dog Park in Main Street Books over the weekend. Yay. Because they sold all of them. <gasps> Yay. Yay! So, A+, plus, I made 18 bucks. <laughs> nice. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Publishing. It's a glamorous business. <laughs> it is. Uh, Brad R. Cook. Uh, I am the writer of Epic Steampunk. Uh, Iron Horseman is my debut novel. It is out there. Go check it out. It is awesomeness. And Iron Zulu is coming later this year, so uh, pick that up, too. Uh, awesome. Excellent. <laughs> awesome. Congratulations. And awesome. today we're going to talk about something even more awesome. We're going to talk about a book that never gets read by anybody. It's called The Series Bible, or hmm. The Universe Bible, or The Story Bible. A hint or here the is continuity Bible. the continuity Bible. The word Bible falls into this all the time. Well, what is that? Let me go ahead and tell you what it is, and then we're going to talk about it. The Story Bible, the Universe Bible, whatever, is a document that writers use, and it started off as a screenwriter um, project, but it's moved over to novels as well. It contains all your main characters, usually supporting characters, major reoccurrences basic relationships. This is kind of a guidebook for the author. Um, all your all your settings, your themes, if you do sci-fi like some of us do, your technology, how far you're willing to go with it, how space opery or hard sci-fi you are. Hmm. If you are writing mysteries, this could also be have in there exactly the details of how the crime was committed without the reader ever knowing. If you're doing a mystery, you may not actually have the detective detect down to the precise moment how the crime was committed, but have an idea, of course, who did it and what they did to do it. Um, some of those Bibles out there that you can see, if you Google the Wire series Bible, you will find the first season's Bible. Um, that is from the TV show the Wire for HBO, which was a crime drama. You can also find Battlestar Galactica's The Reboot first, se first season Bible. I do recommend those both, and there's some other ones out there. Uh, I would just throw out, too, that we're going to call it a Bible a lot, and we're going to call it a book, we're going to call it all this other stuff, but sometimes it's just like a couple of papers stapled together. Mm -hmm. uh, and I would also throw out, if you're at all interested, it's really cool to check out. It's all over the internet. Um... J.K. Rowling's outline for all the Harry Potter novels. Oh, cool. And how she kept everything straight, what was going to happen in what book. Mm -hmm. uh, it's just a giant flowchart looking like kind of thing. Um, so, you know, even though we're going to talk about Bibles and books and stuff, it can be any form. Yeah. The bi the if you're a dungeon master, uh, mm -hmm. it's exactly what you would have yeah. played with. <laughs> exactly. D &D well, Brad, Brad and I started off... DMing, which is how we got into writing, or along with our writing. Um, yeah, the Bible itself does not have to be in any set form, and you do not go around knocking on doors saying, have you seen my Bible? Um, what you do, sorry, bad joke. Play the Bible close to your chest until it gets published. That too. The Bible can be outlines, it can be written long form, and it is something that can be always added to, especially if you're writing a series. Kathleen, you had your hand up a moment ago. Oh, um, 
Was it to make another pun? No, actually. It was to ask what the purpose of the Bibles were in um, in TV shows. Oh, very good question. <laughs> then bring it into how it crosses over into books. Well, actually, and if you could find the first Star Trek, the original series, Bible, it's really an interesting read because it explains why these things exist. If you ever watch a TV series, as all of us do, and it's written by more than one person, unlike Babylon 5, which was really mostly written by the one guy. It was written by a whole lot of people. But mostly written by one. It is a, it is a booklet or a form that keeps all these writers on the same page as they're writing. How they know how to handle the characters, how they know how to handle the universe. Who's what birth date is when. Right. Which character... Yeah, what their likes and dislikes are. So in one episode, he likes poker, and the next episode, he's like, I hate gambling. You can't Ooh. have that. So right. a series Bible will, you know, have these kind of notes in them. Oh, I was going to read from Wiki. Okay. Go for it. Um, it says, show Bibles, um, and this is a type for screenwriters, come in two forms. The first type are updated as the series progresses and are mm -hmm. expanded with information on the characters after the information has been established on screen and often go into extensive detail about the characters' histories. The second type are used as sales documents to pitch a new series to a television network or television studio and help them, mm -hmm. as well as any new writers who might join the writing staff, understand the series. Yep. These types of Bibles discuss the histories of the main characters, as well as the fictional universe the series is set in, and include a mention of future plot lines in the form of a brief outline of each season. I would agree with the wiki. Yeah, mm -hmm. this I is the Wizard for so. series Bible or Bible <laughs> and parentheses it's, screenwriting. It's important, no matter which, uh, if you're dealing with like the second type, to remember to look at the first type because you know you might make some changes. Let's say on a series, especially, let's say your main character, your actress, gets pregnant, and mm -hmm. you write the pregnancy into the script. Well, you better write that into the series Bible too. Oh, or Ivanova breaks her leg <laughs> outside of the mo outside of Claudia the Christian TV series. Claudia Christian breaks her leg being a drunk weirdo, and they have to write it into the episode. <laughs> That's how Matthew Craig Googler broke his leg, being a drunk weirdo. Man, and is she dancing too? I think so. Oh my gosh, mm. okay, so, um, yeah, that actresses happens. Actors should be careful when they get drunk and dance. Actors too. Everyone Good should point. be careful when actors they get drunk and, and actresses. dance. Don't dance when you're drunk if you're an actor or actress because you will break something <laughs> and it will have to be written into a script. Or a director <laughs> or an inventor or, yeah. <laughs> Just don't dance on tables when you're drunk. Let me ask this question. <laughs> talk Cyber talk about fun. where the Bible gets broken. I'm glad you talked about Bad One Five. But before I do this, Kathleen, are you on season three yet? No. no. <laughs> Kathleen, please stick your fingers in your ear and hum real well, loud to yourself. We might have listeners who aren't on season Well, three. this is yeah. this is a spoiler yeah. alert spoiler time. Spoiler alert. All right, um, give me a minute. Okay, okay Kathleen's okay. fingers are in your ear. Let's watch Babylon 5, <laughs> season 3. In Babylon 5, season 3, one of the main characters, Michael Garibaldi, gets injured in a hand-to-hand -hand combat situation, and it's his leg that is hurt. He's walking with a cane, kind of like Ivanova. Mm -hmm. But the very next season, next um, show has him with an arm in his cast, or, or an arm, <laughs> arm in his sling. Uh -huh. So that's where the Bible can be. And actually, not followed by, by that was point. unfortunately they had to do that because the actor insisted on doing his own stunt. And guess what? He broke his arm. Uh -huh. <laughs> so okay, we're good. All right, you're safe. yeah, you're good. I heard none of that, and it will remain that way. That's okay, why fine. we covered it. Thank you guys. You just don't listen to this episode. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I'll, I'll get a we while. Just, we um, just need to get yeah. on this whole watching of Babylon 5. So just, let me ask this question. It's not me, nobody's fault. We'll, we just we'll need to get back. on that. Well, back well, but this is another thing. Like, uh, actors, be careful about doing your own stunts. Is it really worth it? Back to series I, have, um, <laughs> I would like to bring up the point that David mentioned a little bit ago before I covered my ears and made sure I could hear nothing. <laughs> um, breaking your rules. Breaking the rules of your series. I know it's... Um, I think it's easier for writers to do because when we're writing something, when we're writing a story, we're with it. And then it takes a while, but then we finish it and we move on to the next and we're all absorbed in that. And it's mm -hmm. hard to remember details like, I said this person likes poker in you know my last mm -hmm. book. And this book, I need him to dislike gambling. It's hard to remember a little detail that you thought was a throwaway thing. Mm -hmm. So in that case, having a series Bible um, for writers is mm -hmm. very helpful as well. 
it helps you not break your series and then get yelled at by readers or your yes. editor or your agent. Your or... fans will yell at you. May I point out a pet peeve? Very minor pet peeve, but a pet peeve. Yes. So, in Dune, the first Dune, green was the color of mourning. I don't know why green was the color of mourning, but it was green. Mm-hmm. Okay. In one of the sequels, it was yellow. Yellow was the color of mourning. They changed the color of mourning. Now, this is something that had been consistent through hundreds of years of history, then all of a sudden they changed it. That's a violation of the series Bible. Mm -hmm. I wonder if it's because Dune is in a desert and Green is like the complete antithesis of everything they know and love. Whatever. The point is, it was green, then it was yellow because someone didn't keep track of their Bible. It's the color of their skin changes when they've been laying out in the sun. But did it throw you out of the story? Yeah, I was like, wait a minute, you got this detail wrong. Of course, Obviously, I never would have. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I she's never would have caught this if I hadn't have read these books back. And to I don't back. remember that, this. That's so. just it. They'll, you know, they, these little tweaks and yeah, this is do. exactly they what do. people yeah. remember. And mm-hmm. that's exactly why you want to have something like a series bible if you're writing a longer series or a short series, even, or if you're, you know, why they have series bibles for writers who are writing television shows, mm-hmm. because little details like yes. that can throw your viewer or your reader out of the world that you have created and, and that they've willingly immersed themselves in. And that's a really shocking sort of thing. And it, it feels, for me, it feels like a betrayal. Like, why don't you know? But you said, mm. but you lied to me. Your whole job <laughs> no. is not to tell me those kinds of lies. I signed up for a different kind and now I'm mad at you. <laughs> now, there's a different type of breaking it. It's when you, like, the pilot's been put out and you realize you made a major mistake. And there's no way to do it except for changing it and just pretend like it was that way all all the time. Um, Retroconning. Yeah, well, okay, so I think the name of the series was Land of the Giants. Mm-hmm. It's when these astronauts crash onto this alien world where everybody looks like humans, but they were all giants and the people were running around like little Lilliputians. Well, apparently for the first few episodes, the big people spoke a completely alien language that the little people could understand. And then a few... See, so, uh, a few episodes in, they suddenly started speaking English with no explanation. They realized that they had script limitations when you couldn't understand half of the characters on the screen. Right. Yep. And they had to pay for somebody to type in the toaster so people could read what they're saying. Well, but it was from the point of view of the little people, so, you know, it was like, it was just this alien stuff that no one understood. I feel like that was a writing problem that should have been handled and wasn't handled in a good way. Because there, there's a difference, I think, between sub. All right, let me do this. <laughs> Babylon Five. I'm in season two. We've just met Sheridan. This is Babylon Five, the show. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yes, Babylon Five. The I thought TV we were going to do that separate. Go ahead. We'll do that separate. <laughs> Sinclair is the captain of Babylon. Captain, head of Babylon Five. Don't know his position name. He's the guy in charge. Captain Babylon 5. All through season one, we've known that Sinclair is the captain, and we've seen these tendrils of plots coming, like, coalescing around him, and we know that in season two, some of those are going to come out, and it's going to be great. So, season two starts, and Sinclair's gone! (laughs) What just happened? I thought he was staying. That was what we signed up for, and what the show seemed to say was going to happen, we would see him again. Mr. Siffle. Um... Mm. But suddenly there's Sheridan, who also starts with an S. But he's not the same guy. (laughs) And if they had put him there and been like, this is Sinclair. It has always been Sinclair. Sinclair has always been this man. I would have felt terribly cheated. Mm -hmm. What they did instead was find a way to make it happen, to change the actor through the show. Mm -hmm. So that the show could continue. And the actor could be replaced, but the audience would not feel quite as cheated about having a different actor there. Because the character itself was changing instead of, you know, actor. Mm -hmm. So I think Babylon 5 did that very well. It's different when they, when a show pretends that no changes happen. Like soap operas. Yes. Yes. And soap operas have got a great... Roseanne. Roseanne's (laughs) Roseanne's Roseanne's I'm not going to talk about Roseanne. Still not over that. No, I never watched I never watched I don't know what happened in Roseanne. Um, There are two Beckys. Oh. Yeah. Is that one of the children? (laughs) Yes. So your child got replaced. Yes. Uh Uh-huh. Several seasons in, one of the children got replaced. It's a typical Hollywood thing to do. Partridge family, same thing happened. Oh my gosh, what happened to the children? I never (laughs) knew... It was the invasion of the Martians. I can understand... I can understand that, um, because for a family show, you can't replace one 
actor of the children and have it not be weird. Yeah. But um, in the case was where they can change things and explain them through the story, I think they should. So Babylon 5 did that, and it sounds like this uh, Little People, Big People show did not. And maybe it could have? Um, Given an excuse for why suddenly we're speaking English? Yes. Well, so a magical a- universal translator could have, you know, Babel yeah. fishes could have invaded their minds. I don't know. It would have been, you could write an in-series reason for why that happened, but they decided not to, and therefore they... And then it broke. It they kind of broke it, and they created a distracting uh, discordance in the show, as opposed to, even if it is a clunky explanation, any explanation is better than something, you know, the, yeah. the viewer suddenly saying, wait, mm-hmm. I'm watching a TV show. It took us three episodes to learn their language. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Question for everybody. I'm sorry, I'm taking it back. Um, serious Bibles. Who here besides myself has written one? So I've got Ooh, one. I have. I've got one. a couple of them. What do you consider to be essential to your series Bible? Timeline. Okay. Plots, yeah. My outlines. Okay. Descriptions. Maps. Maps. Descriptions. Yeah. I have a description. Like, if I write it down and it becomes a paragraph in the book, then mm-hmm. that paragraph goes into the series Bible so that I know exactly what I said. Mm-hmm. Good. Good one. Yeah, I usually do... I'm in reverse. I do do descriptions of my series Bible. It's just that I'm not taking it out of the story I wrote. I'm writing my series Bible before I write the story. Yeah, I just want to know what made it in, because I never know what's final to the book. Mm -hmm. So Mm -hmm. taking what's final in the book is smarter to me than the six ideas I had before it and figuring out which one I used. Yeah, I I change my series Bible as I go. That's why it's a Word document. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Sounds like the first series Bible that I read from Wikipedia. It's what has happened officially. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, I can go back and retrocon, but when I retrocon, I do the whole thing from the very beginning and figure out what the changes are. I do want everyone to know when you're saying retrocon, I'm thinking retcon. So they mean the same thing, everyone. It's to retroactively go back and change something. Mm-hmm. And really retcon awesome is another way of saying it. For, like, retro stuff. <laughs> retrocon. <laughs> Which one do you take? Go ahead. Uh, I was just going to say, I actually technically have two series Bibles. Uh, one is for each individual book. And then that carries forward. So, like, the descriptions of what the airship looked like, the Sparrowhawk, or what, you know, Captain Baldrick looks like, or specifically how, you know, uh, Genevieve has her clothes or her hair, uh, I, that all goes in one document. Um, I have a separate document that is the arc of the first book, the arc of the second book, the arc of the third book, and kind of a breakdown of mm-hmm. how those... Mm-hmm interact with each other, what flows into what, what carries through each book, what's individual to each book. Yeah, so, I, I, I have two. I also one have for the series and one for the book, I guess would be a good one. I've got what I have a section in my books, or my series Bibles, is always the jargon section. Hmm. If there's jargon, especially like if I'm writing... I wrote a space western not that long ago, but it's not seen the light of day beyond second draft. But it's very much borrowed jargon from the 1870s, though it's set in the future. Well, trust me, they spoke a lot different than we do now, so yes. I always had to go back and forth to it to go, okay, here's what I'm trying to say. Oh, there's there's a phrase. Like, you just you just are, you just are sitting there looking, no, sorry, you can't ignore the corn. What? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I'm sure Fedora probably has something similar, uh-huh. um, you know, but I have a document that actually, sadly, is often up on my uh, computer. Because um, when I sit there and I listen to British shows or I listen to some old movie or it's some period piece or anything that is period time piece to when I'm writing or, more importantly, to the British or something like that, uh, and I hear a cool phrase that I like, mm-hmm. I will write it down. Mm-hmm. Um, and then that way I have a, a living document that just is nothing but cool phrases and cool British slang and cool slang from the past and stuff like that. And I don't dive into that all the time, because I don't want my book to come off caricature-ish. Right. But I will use it, and I will go to it, and I will put it in the book. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, we use, we don't think about it, but we use, um, oh, what do you call it? Um, uh, axioms or uh, phrases, you know, phrases that, for instance, uh, I'm going to pig out on... Idioms. Idioms, thank you. We use idioms all the time, but I can never think of idioms. I can identify one, but I can never think of one, one an example, at least except for obvious ones. And, yeah, I collect idioms and have them. I have and, Race uh, Bannon in the back of my head somewhere just spouting them out to me. 
Uh, for anyone who, who who's a, a fan of Johnny Quest, wow. he's the cool white-haired guy who does all the fighting in Johnny he's, Quest. He's the best character. He is Johnny the best character Quest. on Johnny Quest, yeah. and his favorite. Son, he says it all the time. Is uh, it's uh, colder than a catfish on marble or something like that? <laughs> you know, there, there's a bunch of them, but uh, he, he's yeah somewhere in the back of my brain. But he just over there. rolls them all out. My Censoring himself for Johnny. Yes. <laughs> my favorite are literal translations from other languages. Because sometimes you can figure out what they mean, and sometimes you can't. <laughs> I am a hybrid plotter and pantser, and I believe all of you guys are plotters. Does that have anything to do with your having created a series Bible? I'm a hybrid. As how does well. it relate to your. Well, number one, how it relates to what I do is. It allows me a not to fall off the wheels. Let me. I know I'm not gonna throw the author under the t under the bus proverbially. She never did commit this error. I don't think, except for in her drafts, which she fixed. Was her character did not like to fly. I'm looking at oh. Brad. He should know what I'm talking about. Yeah, I and know he, this and one. And that character gets ready to jump on a plane. Oh, it's less time to go fly. Mm, you hate flying. Why? Why mm -hmm. are you doing that? So it lets me keep that stuff straight. Also, too, I find. When I straight pants, all the characters are really nothing more than cookie cutters of each other. Um, and this way I'm able to play with the personalities enough that I've got somebody completely unique, somebody who, who I wouldn't have thought of off the top of my head, and I get to play with. Go ahead. So does, when you plot a novel, are mm -hmm. you creating your series Bible and that's literally how you're plotting? That's how I'm plotting. So you can have one, you can have a series Bible for a standalone novel then? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. The only thing I wouldn't do the series, bi series Bible for is a short story. So At this that point is, a, is a story Bible then? Yeah, it's not really All a right. series Bible. It's more like a continuity, mm -hmm. uh, you know. One of the book. other terms for it. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Because at that point, it's about making certain that the character you're writing on page one is the same, looks the same, acts the same, says the same stuff on the last page. Yeah. Right. I don't remember who this author is, but I was listening to an interview about a guy that wrote a biography about this famous author. And this famous author was a famous procrastinator. So if he had to get the first half of this novel done by such and such a date, and he needed the second half done six months later. Well, he didn't get the second half started until ten days before it was due. Mm -hmm. And he forgot the names and appearances of all his characters. So when he got the the novel, the, the second half turned in, his editor called him, apparently he was a very big deal, said, okay, all your characters' appearances and names change. I can tell who's who. Mm -hmm. Which way do you want, the first half or the second half? And this author says, leave it as is. Why? I don't know, but apparently he knew his audience and none of his audience complained. So halfway well, through that book, all the all the characters' appearances and names change. They went to the spa. <laughs> yeah. There's one book. Yeah. There's one book that yeah, caused me to stop reading this author for 15 years because she broke her character. Hmm. And it, it, a series Bible would have worked if she, I'm assuming she didn't have one, but that would surprise me. She, t I'm not going to throw the author's name under the bus, nor the books I'm going to change what I can. Well, yeah, still keep the situation the same. Let's take, let's take, for example, I'm going to use Brad Cook over there. Uh-oh. Let's, do make, it. let's make him a character. My book is good. No, no, no you didn't <laughs> do it. Brad Cook, not Brad R. Cook. Not, yeah. Brad, Brad, we'll make Brad a pulled up by his bootstraps off the streets of Brooklyn, self-made millionaire. How you doing? <laughs> he gets married to this really strong woman. Long story short... She gets impregnated by a demon. Demon comes out. Yada, yada, yada. Yada, yada, yada. <laughs> and Brad fights this demon to the death. Well, and he has a heart attack. And yes, anybody who knows the real story probably has already caught on to who I'm talking about. But if you haven't, yay, I'm not destroying it for you. <laughs> I'm intrigued. Um, and, and he's drowning in a pool as he's having a heart attack. And the demon and his wife go running off ah. to live together. Well, Brad is later, he's recuperated from, from this heart attack, and he's watching the Mardi Gras parade. And he's got one of his, I forget his aunt, or his, his um, niece or nephew, one of the kids, anyway, there. And he's holding them, watching the parade, and the self-made, strong, kick-butt millionaire goes, I hope my wife comes back to me. 
in a mamby pamby wimpy way. It's like that is so far out of character. You you missed something with your character. Yes. What happened? But anyway, that's another reason why I have a series battle. So that way you can keep track of how this character is supposed to be and how the changes to that character. The heart attack out. changed as a person. I was going to say. <laughs> Suddenly, the I heart attack of those changed a lot of things. Apparently, mm-hmm. uh-huh. Brad. But they were not explained. <laughs> he loved Brad. <laughs> Names are well, and I'll be honest, the person who, uh, I borrowed the person's book, <laughs> and she told me not to read the epilogue, which is what I did. And you, went, you went straight home to read the epilogue? No, no, I read the whole entire book straight through, and then I read the epilogue, which she had told me not to, but the book otherwise ended with him having a heart attack in the middle of the pool. It's like, I can't stop there. And that's why I read it. And I was in the kitchen at work. Slam the book cover. By the way, it took about 900 pages to get into this book. Mm-hmm. Slam the book cover, and I do. I get ready to throw it into the trash can that's across the room, and I do the fake fake pictures pitch because I realize, oh, wait a minute, that's not my own book. Can't mm-hmm. do that. You were warned. You yes. Did I was not warned. obey the warning. But back to the series Bible. It's, yeah. This is the purpose of it, is to keep you straight. Um, I was going to take series Bible in a different direction. Please. Um in it's similar to if anyone out there makes games, playable mm. games, interactive media. Um, in the gaming world, the series Bible is known as the uh, the, the development document. Yep. Mm-hmm. So you get your uh, your set of rules that outline how the game functions and how what is going to be included. And while you can add things, having said documents is essential because in a game situation you're working with multiple people just like in a series television movie situation sometimes even in a book situation you're working with multiple people on the same story and you're trying to keep a consistent vision of it additionally in game development uh, it prevents something that we like to call feature creep where one guy decides that it would be really cool if now everyone could shoot lightning bolts from their hands and works for three weeks on the lightning bolt thing and completely forgets the core game mechanics. And then those are the, the game itself fails because the core mechanics are underdeveloped because everyone was working on something they thought was real cool and started mm-hmm. working on it. So another goal of a, of a continuity bibles to keep the creator or team of creators focused on the essential parts before you start wandering off into magic fairyland and adding lightning bolts and things like that yep that leads actually into my question is tone included in a series bible can absolutely be. can be it depends everybody writes the series bible differently that's why i say it can be but yes if tone is extremely important to the to the to story let me use Battlestar Galactica, for example, <laughs> where Tone very much is. And it says so in the first season Bible of this is going to be a bunch of people on the run. They don't have time to sit there and fix things. They are not on the USS Enterprise where everything's nice and shiny. Things are going to be breaking apart. And they've got to deal with it and they're stuck in space for long periods of time. I still want to know deal with it. who lost this Bible after the writer's strike. Uh, <laughs> well, well, more. It got I, deleted. And it's and on the internet. It's on the internet. <laughs> and yes, to all my fellow Right Packs members, you guys have got access to the PDF of it. Well, just to throw it out there, a kind of a bad example of this mm-hmm. is Star Trek. <laughs> Especially, <laughs> to be honest, all of them. <laughs> <laughs> where you will have the episode where the entire universe is coming to a head and everything's being destroyed and ripped apart and war is there. And then the next one's about the fuzzy tribble. Yeah. You know, or something like that, where you, you've just, it's, you know, oh, look, we're on this planet, and this cool thing's happening, and oh, look, now they're all Nazis. Yeah, you know, and then you go off, and the next one's back to, oh, the universe is destroyed. Oh, and now. time travel is super easy, or time travel is super hard. Yeah, I haven't, uh, I haven't watched Deep Space Nine yet, but I am watching someone on Tumblr watch it. So every episode, they put up just, like, uh-huh. a GIF and a statement to kind of speak their mind and there's they're in the middle of the last two seasons which is where the plot really kicks in mm-hmm. and then suddenly they're playing baseball yes, <laughs> yes. And it was such a tone yes. shift she's yes. like the hell just happened <laughs> yes that did happen oh on- i remember that yes <laughs> those have my those if you i don't know if we've talked about it on right pack radio or not but that did happen under captain hawk's um watch if anybody has knows avery brooks yes. he's known for two main characters from tv one is Hawk, and one is 
Captain Sisko. Well, when Captain Sisko shaves his head, he then becomes Captain Hawk. He starts mm-hmm. acting like the other character, <laughs> which I loved. Go ahead. On the topic of Star Trek. Mm. Always the topic of Star Trek. Um, yes, J.J. Abrams really did break the Bible on that one. No. Uh, not I don't think he read it. <laughs> he didn't care yeah, about Yeah, he didn't the care about the Bible. Go ahead. On the topic of Star Trek, mm-hmm. something that is necessary for that show is a certain amount of resetting where the consequences of certain actions and certain arcs in specific show like episodes cannot impinge upon other episodes the ones around them but episode in a bottle basically yes but there are certain parts of the episode and certain character arc um continuations that need Mm -hmm. to be kept throughout the the season and the series. Mm-hmm. So how do you balance stuff like that when you're making a series Bible for other people? Well, that's exactly where your series Bible comes into play. So say you have, you know, there are going to be 22 episodes that season. You have 10, 12 writers writing them. Mm-hmm. You know, and that's kind of a lot, but, you know, we're just going to use that for numbers. Mm-hmm. So each of them is going to get a different story arc. Say half to three-quarters of the show are going to feature the main plot lines that are running across the entire season. But then you have those episodes that are standalone, which are meant to be fun, explore some new avenue of the character. If you notice, in Star Trek especially, every character gets an episode eventually. Uh-huh. So you got the Geordi episode, you got the Dr. Crusher episode, you've got, you know. So you, you go through and explore the characters, which is one of the ways you can do this. Um, but a series Bible allows you to turn over one document to all those writers, and say, have fun, create whatever you want to create. If you're going to do something with this character, it has to fall under this line, because this is what they're doing this season. Mm-hmm. And let me, I'm just going to paste, I don't want, I, I, before we lose it, I'm going to paste on to what Brad's saying. Remember, when Star Trek first came out, the original series, Gene Roddenberry had no control, absolutely none, over the the order in which the TV um, CBS at the time was going to display each yep. episode. That continued into play until you finally see Deep Space Nine. Mm-hmm. Deep Space Nine and actually part of Next Generation started to do this. You start to see these arcs that there are yeah. one episode after another episode after another episode, an interconnection and then of course they've reset. It might be the X Files that is the first real show to like run an entire season of one storyline. It could be, or if not, it was Babylon Five, one of the two. Uh, Be Five pioneered it in sci-fi. Yeah, Uh, obviously, soap operas were pioneering that in drama, Mm -hmm. but it was that was part of uh, Straczynski's pitch was Mm -hmm. that it's going to be this is new and different. We're going to do a consistent storyline. Now, in the two years between him pitching it and actually finding television or finding a deal, uh, other people. Mm -hmm tried that too but right. he was he was pitching it as something new back when b5 was concepted mm-hmm. either one of you two <laughs> you both had your fingers up what were oh. you adding kathleen oh i was not actually adding anything i was reading the star trek next generation series bible online. <laughs> oh, <there> you <laughs> you're supposed to do your homework before class kathleen well i i'm looking at it because i want to know what the essential features of a story bible are it would mm-hmm. seem that they would be different depending on what it is you're doing yes. yeah okay yes. so, and so different for, between novels and movies and tvs and yes yes for yes. one thing for like a sci-fi series or a novel a sci-fi novel too one of the things that I would put in a Bible that might not go in other series is technology, ba- mm-hmm. basics of how it works, what it can do, and what it can't do. Right, mm-hmm. the limitations of technology. So it's it's kind of important that, you know, if this type of weapon can penetrate this shield and blow up the ship really easily one day, mm-hmm. it needs to be able to do that the next day. I want to cite an example of not use, no, misuse of that, <laughs> and uh, I'm going to do Mass Effect. <laughs> Uh, I love Mass Effect dearly, and there's a concept within Mass Effect that is technically space magic. It's uh, biotics. Bionics. Bi- bi- biotics. I biotics. I yes. was right the first time? Okay, yep. good. I had, a, I had a brain malfunction. But uh, biotics are, uh, it's, it's technically space magic, but there's a scientific reason for it, and it has limitations. Uh, when inside the uh, inside the games, you know the three Mass Effect games, those limitations are respected and they follow the rules. Now, when you branch out into the expanded universe novels, 
there are a couple writers that obviously did not do the research as to what biotics are capable of and pretty much turned it into the force, which is <laughs> not. People were getting uh, visions of the future. Uh, they were conjuring things out of nothing. These, these are things that biotics cannot do. Biotics can lift stuff and explode stuff and move stuff. It's a lot more like telekinesis than the force, which can also lift stuff and yeah. move stuff and explode stuff, but... It can also let you can see also the future. Let you see the future. Yes. So it's, uh, I'm sure the Bible was handed to the writers, but whether or not they respected it is another matter entirely. And I think that book, or another one that broke it even worse, actually did a reprint in which they went back and fixed it. <laughs> because enough people complained about how bad it was. I like it. Now, mm. here's something that, for instance, the TV series Castle, I assume... <laughs> that they do not include technology in their series Bible. However, they could. Because if you notice, they do things on Castle that cannot be done in the real world. Mm -hmm. They have this memory erasing technique that somehow works, and they can make diamonds the size of baseballs. And, you know? <laughs> it's Castle. Yeah, yeah. you got to have some leeway to have a little fun. Yeah. But actually, I was going to throw out my two favorite in terms of the breaking of the said technology. And I'm going to call out comic books and Star Trek with this. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, and she and Jen hit on one of them. But the first one is any kind of telepathy, telekinesis, anything like that, mm -hmm. where instantly telepathy, which is a thing and is mental communication between two minds, mind, suddenly mind, is moving stuff, mind. which is telekinesis. Uh -huh. That's mm -hmm. a different kind of power. You want to mix them all together? Okay, but let's talk about that. Psychor. First, let's the make sure. The second one <laughs> is <possible>. Tachyon Field. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Which, oh, yeah. if you know your comic books, can do anything from create a force field to cut through animantium and all that kind of fun <laughs> and stuff. And bake you bake your a cupcake, too. Yeah, and move <laughs> forward and backward in time. And if you mm -hmm. are in, you know, Star Trek, then tachyon fields can literally do anything. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, yeah. trips, yeah. And if Jordy gets his hands on it, or Data, then... It's <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's rough. Yeah. 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 But those two, and especially the tachyon field. Oh, the tachyon field. That, that <laughs> word, I can't even tell you how many times I have either read or heard the word tachyon. <laughs> The tachyon is the force. Yes. Sounds yes. tacky to me. The, the, tacky. Yeah. Yep. On. Okay, so. I'm going to tack Kathleen, this on you asked and maybe what, it's okay. You asked what's important to in a Bible. I pulled yes. on two Bibles for just to discuss. And these are The Wire and Battlestar Galactica. This is what's in The Wire's Bible. All right. They just have an overview of the series, the setting, and descriptions of the setting. And what I mean by that is how the city works and the... If you know the wire, it looks at how systems fail, how City Hall fails, how a union fails, how the drug market, illegal drug market fails, and the cops fail, and all this stuff. Okay, characters, goes into a description of the characters, which, by the way, for those who want to really read the Bible, guess what? The main character in the Bible, uh, a main character in the wire's name got changed from the Bible to the, to the airing, just to let you know, or to the filming. Then it talks about each of the episodes. That's the wire. Yeah. Now let me see if I can, hopefully I can find the other one again. I can compare it to what's in Star Trek while you're finding it. Go for it, and then I'll do, then I'll do Battlestar Galactica. The Star Trek TNG Next Generation Story Bible that I'm looking at has these contents. These are the voyages, and that section is basically um, the Enterprise mission, what's changed from the original series, what is staying the same, what the next generation is going to be. Then it goes into the script, believability, what doesn't work, and forms. So it's kind of like um, the uh, the guidelines for submission, um, as far as what I've been looking at. Mm -hmm. The submission guidelines you'd see mm -hmm. on a writing uh, magazine or book. Um, then it goes to Starship Enterprise, so it explains the sets and the community and the look of the show. And then it goes into more on the Starship crew and the main characters. And it goes into them in more detail than it did when it first introduced the new crew under These Are the Voyages. Uh -huh. Then it has writers and directors notes about terminology, weaponry, the ship's computer. And finally, it has an appendix on scientific terminology. So, tacky, I feel mean. yeah. mm -hmm. <laughs> anything you want. Let me, let me go into Battlestar Galactica. <laughs> let me go, I, the I lithium tachyons. crystals. When I create a series Bible, I really do use Battlestar Galactica's first season series Bible as my template. Because I like what it does, so, does in it. From a table of contents, and then I'm going to turn around and I'm going to read you the mission statement that 
is very first thing is the mission statement. Then it talks about the twelve colonies. Now, if you know about Battlestar Galactica, you know the twelve colonies are very important. It goes into the history, so, the backstory. religion, backstory. culture, technology. Then it talks about the Cylons, culture and technology. Character biographies, which it goes through one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine main characters. Then it goes through storylines. The tension, the structure, the Cylons, the plot driven devices, and the character stories. Then it talks about season one, story arcs, character arcs. Then it's still not done. It, then it goes into the Battlestar Galactica itself. History, combat operations, flight operations, CIC, maneuvering, damage control, enlisted in officers, fast, faster than light, and what the red line is. What is the red line? Ah, the red line. You can't, you're, that's as far as they can plot to jump. Oh. And if you jump past the red line, you're jumping into the unknown. Ah, now, I, I just figured something out about something completely different. <laughs> <laughs> Hold on. This was what Ronald D. Ronald D. Moore wrote Ronald as D. McDonald. <laughs> wrote as the first couple sentences for his of the mission statement. And just to let you know, if you want to read this, I guess I'll put I'll put this out there on the you Facebook page. Up. But um, this actually has a couple paragraphs, but I'm just going to read the first couple um, things here. Our show is built on the idea that a science fiction series can employ groundbreaking special effects, dynamic cinematography, realistic situations, believable characters, and explore contemporary social and political issues without sacrificing dramatic tension and excitement. (laughs) Keep going down. He's got three types of arcs going at all times. Series arcs, multiple episode arcs, and and episodic arcs. And he says the series is about a chase. Let the chase begin. Now, I've skipped a lot that's in between each of those statements. Yeah. But that gives you an idea of what the mission statement is. And it's interesting to uh, hear those guidelines and then having watched the show, see Uh how those kind of came to life and when they got a little abandoned and all those Mm -hmm. things. So how could you tell when they'd been abandoned? Well, since the first thing written down on that was it's a chase and the last thing is let the chase begin... When they land on a planet for a year is kind of when it breaks the book a little bit. <laughs> yeah. And it changed the tone of the show when that happened, too. You could tell that they were kind of running out of ideas based on their, their Bible. Maybe Battle they needed... Star Galactica 1982, wasn't it? <laughs> <laughs> 1980. Yeah, That's a completely different uh, departure from Battlestar yes. Galactica canon. <laughs> And I am cringing over here. I'm really cringing. I think it's a really good indicator of when you need a strong showrunner. Yes. Someone whose dream it's the show kind of is. Mm. Someone who's the director of everything, who's in charge of uh, herding all the cats into the right yep. pens. Everyone Which else is the can author be, if you're the book. But if, you're yeah. the, if it's a book, you're, you're the author. If it's a movie, it's the director. If it's a game, it's the director. If it's a... TV or possibly show, the showrunner, the, or possibly the producer, or the producer, depending on if you're doing independent game development, yeah. or if you're doing <laughs> by uh, 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 investor game development. On a related to showrunners note, there is a documentary called Showrunner hmm. or Showrunners. I forgot if it has this, but it talks about running a TV show. From the perspective of a whole bunch of different showrunners, Joss Whedon included. It's really good. I recommend it. It's about an hour and a half long. You can find it. Sounds good. So, oh. Jen, what did you think What did you think of? We saw the light bulb go off about red lines. Oh, um, well, just that it was, the, the red line is a term that I've seen used in other, um, after Battlestar Galactica, uh, sci-fi canon. Mm-hmm. Uh, specifically, I was thinking, uh, like, the independent video game FTL, Faster Than Light, which if you like strategy, I recommend. It's probably the best Star Trek game you'll ever play. (laughs) (laughs) It has nothing to do with Star Trek, but it has the best Star... But you can download a mod that'll skin it for you. (laughs) Um, But in that one, there is a red line, literally, a red line that chases you through space. And if you fall behind the red line, you get attacked by rebels. And if you don't fall behind the red line, you have a chance of escaping. So that's what I, when you use like the red line, it's like, oh, hey, yeah, mm-hmm. that terminology bridged the gap into something else that I know about. And that was why See? a light went off. It's, <laughs> it's shine, it shows me that um, 
the people who are responsible for FTL are probably big fans of general sci-fi, and mm-hmm. maybe they even read the show Bible when they, you know, at some point in their history before they put together their Oh, um, another book. It's a fiction book. It's a parody, in fact. Huh. I don't remember the author, but the title of the book is Red Shirts. Mm-hmm. And while it doesn't have anything to do directly with series Bibles, the writer obviously knows all about series Bibles. <laughs> Now the uh, funny red shirt story, you know, red shirt is a uh, Star Trek them mm-hmm. because the in the original series, uh, people wearing red shirts were on security staff, and so therefore they were always the ones that were thrown at the bad guy with guns, and usually they ended up getting killed. Except for Scotty. Except for Scotty, he's he's uh, he's bra- he's uh, he's man enough to he's only man enough to wear a red shirt, a kilt, and drink scotch. Scotty's yes. the best. But the that rule changed in the next generation. Yes. They sorted it around so that red was now command color and that sort of an an olive beer wax color was the security. Yeah. But the thing so, is it's still a Hollywood term. Red shirts die. Yeah, well that's yes. <laughs> Did I kill your story? Yeah, it's it's gone now. Oh, sorry. Rest in peace. <laughs> red shirted my story. Oh, <laughs> So yeah, show Bibles. I would like to ask. In a transporter ask... accident. <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> it appeared in the next generation. Suddenly. Exactly. I suddenly oh, see my. a thing that looks like a worm coming at me to bite me. Okay, go ahead. Get a kilt. Get a kilt and wave it around like a bull. Ah. You just need a cool accent. I like it. That's what Scotty survived. He had a cool accent. So he Kirk was going to keep him around. All yes. right. Bye, laddie. So the essential features of a story Bible for a TV show are different from what the essential features of a story Bible would be for, say, a shared universe written story. Mm-hmm. Okay. Like um, Border Town, which has a lot of different authors who were writing about p- characters of their own in this same shared city between, you know, Fae and human, where there's magic and it causes mayhem, and not everyone is magic or human necessarily. Mm-hmm. So what is essential to have in a shared universe story Bible that may not be essential to have in one that's just for you. Well, okay. A, a really great example of um, being able to expand on a universe uh, through handing off your dream and everything to everybody else was done in uh, The Matrix, actually, <laughs> uh, with the Animatrix, uh, which, if you ask me, is better than the movies. It's um, definitely better than the last two. Yes. But The Animatrix is a series of short animations, stories, uh, that are within the universe of The Matrix. Most of them explain some other storyline that was in the movies, but was never touched on. So, like, the kid who follows Neo around, uh, you know, why is he following him around? This is explained in one of the shorts. Hmm. Now, I'm sure they took... Here's the the universe of the Matrix, and handed it over to these directors and these animators, and said, "You guys tell your own story." Because the stories they told completely ind- independent. Some of them went in really weird and crazy ways. They were there, you know. Each director got their own ability to create a story, so long as it, you know, fell within the universe of the Matrix, followed the different, you know, specific things like you know having them. You know, either in the Matrix or out of the Matrix, the way that it worked, mm-hmm. the way that everything kind of went, the agents. So, it allowed it allowed the producers of the Matrix, you know, the Wachowski brothers, and the Wachowskis. Wachowskis siblings, excuse yeah, me, yeah, the Wachowskis, uh, the Wachowskis, to create, uh, you know, this huge universe that had all these intricate storylines that ran through it, that had all this without them actually having to be the ones to produce that content. And so that is something that is very different from what I use my story Bible for. I'm the only one who ever is going to read the story Bible in the series, um, my series arcs, Mm -hmm. for the Iron Chronicles. Nobody would ever have any real desire, because if you've read the books, I mean, that's all that's in the... You know, you want to see my bad notes where I'm, like, talking about who's going to do what, or which sword fight goes where. You can, but, you know... Uh, the reality the is, yeah, care. nobody nobody wants that. Nobody really is going to pay attention to that. But if I had to suddenly create an entire series and a bunch of short stories and a bunch of animated, you know, uh, shorts and then a bunch of, you know, like, kind of video game or, you know, media content, 
I can produce all that. I'd have to hand off, you know, here's what an Iron Horseman is. Here is what an Iron Armor is, you know. Here is what an airship looks like. Here is what technology can do in the, in the 1880s. Mm-hmm. So I would have to have something I could, a document I could hand out to other people. So there really are two very different things. It's something that somebody's going to read and see and use versus my scribbled notes that nobody really gives a butt about but me. Unless you're J.R.R. Tolkien and you, didn't you republish it as the Marillion. Yes. Yes. Oh, to make it so big that you can publish your, you know, your it's, notes. It's your and, world building. Yes, your world building and your notes and all that. Kathleen, before Seriously. I turn it over to you. I did publish a article back on a blog of mine a long time ago, and I think I'll try and re- rewrite it and republish it on the writer's lens about um, series Bibles. And it is called, what was it called? Keeping it organized, stealing a tool from screenwriters. But I will republish that on writer's lens in the next couple of weeks, so by the time this airs, it will be out there. I don't have a link for it yet, people, so keep a lookout for it. And I will have examples of other series Bibles besides the ones we talked about. So, what's in your series Bible and the format it takes is directly related to its audience, whether it's you or for other people, Uh and its purpose, whether Uh it's to help keep you, your details in line for yourself, or to show other people how to do the writing for whatever it is Mm -hmm. the project is. Exactly. Okay. So, how do I know that I haven't written a series Bible? I've written. Probably have. (laughs) I've never called it as such. I have documents that tell me things about the main characters that I use to help keep me in, in uh, keep my details accurate throughout the whole thing. So does that make it a series Bible, or does that just make it a document of notes that helps me keep things straight? Go ahead. I, yeah, I was to say. use an idiom, six and one half dozen of the other. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I was, uh, was going to say... Uh, or is that just a I've saying? seen Thanks. your... I've seen your notes, Kathleen. You've sent me some of them before. Uh, and yeah, you've written yourself a series Bible, whether it's going under that name or not. It's a resource that you've created to help organize your thoughts into a cohesive, kind of stapled down final yeah. version. Final, air quotes, final version. Um, if it makes you uncomfortable to call it a series Bible, you need not do that. But that's the term that we're using in this episode yeah. for an organization of documents. I call mine my linking book. Because it's a misreference, I uh, I have a black <laughs> I have a black moleskin, and it's the linking book to Threadcaster. And when okay. I open it up, Threadcaster is inside. It's got all my stuff in it. I write it all down. It's got a whole bunch of rough plot outlines. It has all of the old versions of the characters, and I yeah. fold a little corner over when that character has evolved and reference to the future where the new character sheet is is listed. But I can see kind of how it's grown, and in the end. Yeah, you know, there's room in the back in case there's a sequel, but we're going to see if we sell the book first. Um, it's going to contain the world of that novel in that book. And do I use it? Not all that often, actually. I'm pretty good at keeping details in my brain, but when I add something new, it's good to open it back up, look through, see what's changed, see if the new thing I've added is interfering with anything I've already set in stone. Like, if I decided that uh, fire curses explode in flames when they die... But there's a scene where I need everyone to be in a really close quarters when one of them kicks it and it's going to burn everyone to death. I should probably go back and change it so that they die slowly in a whimper instead of a huge explosion with you know flames flying everywhere. Mm. Oh, Sorry, that's really funny. Yeah. No, also, I do want to say, Mist as in M-Y-S-T, the game, not M-I-S-S-E-D, which is what I thought you meant at first. <laughs> no, yeah. Mist. No. Yes. Sorry, done. Lovely game. No, but... It, Call it what you will. You can call it backstory. You can call it a character sheet. You can call it, you know, a series Bible. You know, it can take whatever form and come under whatever name. But the minute you write anything down about your character that isn't going in the book, that's part of your series Bible. So if those are just loose leaf paper that's hanging around that you reference, if you put them all together, if it's one document, I don't think it matters. Yeah, I think that's just terminology that... It's only because humans really like to name everything. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, to be honest, any of that is a series Bible or, a, you know, a showrunner document or, a, you know, any of the terminology we've been using. The Silmarillion. Yep. <laughs> Anne McCaffrey. It's my Silmarillion. <laughs> Needs one. <laughs> no, well, from what I understand, she had one. No, it was all handwritten. Yeah, that's And from what I understand, it was... I've never seen it. I've always had this image. If you ever go into a... 
auto repair place they usually had they used to have i don't know nowadays they do not this big huge catalog of a book with the length of maybe half of a table and it, it's got pages inside they flip through i always had a picture that's what of hers was mm-hmm. that's, that's like. online now it probably is <laughs> it, i don't know huge. her state's kind of tight with their stuff so yeah, see, the problem with doing that is if you become a popular author like Anne McCaffrey, your series Bible gets so big, and if it's not online, you can't do online searches, and uh, you forget, you know, details about your characters, like how many children they have and how old they are. Yeah, in the when same, they appear. <laughs> yeah, in the same book, a char- two characters go from being the same age to one character being an adult and marrying the other one not being old enough to have a job yet, you uh-huh. know. <laughs> so it sounds like... Your ability to organize and reference your series Bible is also really important when you're creating one. Yeah, because if you write to make it much usable. <laughs> if you if you write everything by hand in a series of different notebooks, say, which I've written free writes in all sorts of different notebooks about the same project, mm-hmm. um, not having access to those notebooks or not having transcribed that into a single unified document will make it more difficult for me to actually keep the things that I have set as set in stone. Which is why mine's on my computer. Right. To be very dramatic in what Brad just said, mine's on my computer. If I did it your way, Kathleen, whatever works for you works yes. for you. And let me let me start off by saying that. Whatever works out there, people, for you to keep all your notes together and make sure that you don't break your storyline, keep at it. For me personally, if I did it Kathleen style... Well, what he thinks is Kathleen style. Well, I think it's Kathleen style. <laughs> it's not. I would look more like... Um, Patrick Stewart because my hair would be all gone very quickly because I would lose one of those important notebooks. What? Okay, well that's just me. Um, I know me. I would. I would definitely lose it. Mm-hmm. I do what Brad did as far as I keep mine online. But I don't know Brad if you do this or not. But I link the sections. If you know Word document, yeah. you can go in and you can actually have it link. Like uh, you, you have table of contents. You can do it on Scrivener too. You can table of contents link it and you just click on that link. It takes that part. Of a document. That's how obsessive compulsive I am on the series Bible. Now, if you really don't want to use a computer, you can get a binder. That way, you can actually move pages around and at least have them all in the right section. I'd lose it. Go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, the binder is a good idea. Uh-huh. And something that I do before. is I I think uh-huh. very well writing by uh-huh. hand. I think uh-huh. better. I think writing by hand than on a computer, which is different from how I write stories. I write stories better on a computer. But all the free writes that I have about a certain project, I will flag on, in the notebook. I'll put a sticky mark on it, and then I will go to my computer later, and I will type all of them up in the document that goes with that story. So mm-hmm. everything does stay together. It's a matter of making the process work for me, and mm-hmm. that's how I do it. And I think just a sidebar real fast, that's how a lot of everything we do in our art, what we like to call writing, whatever works for you, works. It's better to get something on paper than not get something on paper. Yeah, you can fix that. (laughs) You can't fix the blank page. So the series Bible then, the story Bible, the universe Bible, the development document, the continuity Bible. The Bible. The thing that you write to help you keep everything on track. It's really important for a lot of writers, and it sounds like many of us, myself included, probably do this unconsciously, not recognizing what we do as this a series mm-hmm. bible mm-hmm. and it's just what we do to keep everything organized and straight so mm-hmm. can i call everything that i do a series bible now that's notes or is there if you're keeping it together yes, yes. And i suppose you're keeping it together not necessarily together as in one booklet i mean together it's like maybe the same shelf on your bookshelf or something or you say you transcribe it into the computer so the stuff in the computer is your series how are you bible. how do you want to do it what's a good way well okay So I'm new, I guess, to writing series Bibles as, well, thinking that I am. Mm -hmm. I know I tend to include things about characters, things Mm -hmm. about places, and things about the plot that will happen and that have happened. And I also keep free writes about the project as I'm going along in there so that I know what my thinking process is for Mm -hmm. everything. The plot outline that has already happened also goes there. Mm -hmm. Ken? And sometimes photos, pictures of characters. Mm-hmm. That Most also certainly. helps me. Most certainly in my case, yes. What do you guys include in yours? Is there anything on that list that's not in yours or that I missed that well, you guys do include? I don't include pictures, but there's no, absolutely nothing wrong with including pictures. I just don't. 
I don't really care all that much about the physical description. Relatively speaking, mm -hmm. I don't picture my characters as strongly as a lot of people do. Mm -hmm. Because a lot of my universes deal have their own jargon. Jargon mm -hmm. falls into it. Um, Technology. Yeah, that's part of it. Technology. Um, Medical conditions, especially the ones that aren't real. Well, that's what I was going to go into. Is the characters, I go into a very deep dive into my characters, so they're in there. Uh, essentially, because I write historical fantasy... Uh, I will put in historical events that happen within the timeline so that I know that I can call upon that if I need. Um, I might also keep... I keep notes about... specifically about what I set. So, because the description that I give you of, say, this, you know, of an airship or of a castle or of something, I want to know specifically what I said so that I can come back to that, which is why I'll just cut and paste what I actually wrote in the book and what's, you know, right there so that it's that doesn't change, you know, and I know what I said, so I can go back and say, you know, did I say that it was a, it had a blue bottom and a, you know, gray top or a gray top and a blue bottom, you know, I don't know. So I'll go back and I'll read that. Um, and then, you know, I, I try and include, uh, if I said a character has wears their hair a certain way, their clothes a certain way, uh, if they carry something specific, what it is. So like, you know, Genevieve's Locket, I have a huge series of paragraphs about what it looks like, what's in it, you know, all that kind of fun stuff. Something, oh, on a related note to that specifically, I do that with characters. I need to know exactly what I said about a character and how it was when I described them. Yeah. Because there are characters like um, Celine Riley, for example, who is a witch. And if I just wrote what color her hair was and what color yeah. her eyes were, mm -hmm. and that she was a certain character's mother, that would not tell me enough. No, no, no. I would need. I want the tone. See, and I'm more than that. I don't just. I don't just flag like what their birthday is and their hair mm -hmm. color. For me, it's. That's why I want what I actually said in the book, because I don't want to just know that, you know, you Genevieve know has auburn hair. Them. I want to know. Yeah, exactly. And the nuances. How of did that. I describe the curve of her hair, the flow, the curls in her oh, hair? Oh, and if it's you know, ongoing, uh, like the the characteristics, I want to stay the same. Mm -hmm. I like highlighting green and the characters, the characteristics I don't really care about. I might do in a different country. Like, yeah, if this needs to change for the plot, I'm fine with changing it. This is just the placeholder thing I mm. have right now. I also sometimes try and use similar language so that, you know, when I talk about her hair, I say a certain phrase and then you know that's, you know, it's Genevieve. A tag. The tag to yeah, the it is. It's a new tag for the person. As a as an illustrator, a lot of my series Bible is just images. Yes. Yeah. I uh, I write down some things that need to be written down, but a lot of specifically talking Threadcaster, uh, there's a progression of disease in the book. So I have charts for each uh, each class of people, each of the different elements. I have charts showing the stages of their their illness. I could write that down, but because I think visually, I tend to draw them. And every character, I don't know who they are until I've drawn them and drawn them in specific scenes and designed a couple outfits for them. It's great fun. So that's kind of a different, that's a series Bible element that might not be in everybody's Bible, but it's definitely in mine. And it's all part of world building. Yeah, mm -hmm. exactly. I mean, everything we're doing, the series Bible is literally just the written down version of your world building. Mm -hmm. So your world building probably goes in there too, but... And with that, really, the series Bible, as I said before, this is a screenwriter's technique. It is something which we can incorporate into our novel writing. I guess you can do it in short story writing if you're doing a series of short stories. But <laughs> beyond that, no, well, I guess what I want to say before we alarm went off saying, David, shut up, it's time to end this episode, mm -hmm. is everything, all these, all our medias of writing can learn from each other. Series Bible, I think, is a great tool that novelists can learn from screenwriters. And if you are inter more interested into it as before, I will put up a rewrite of an article onto Writer's Lens in a couple weeks. Give the uh, the web address for the Writer's Lens. www.thewriterlens.com It's been a while. Uh, dot com? Com. com. It's been a while since I've written for it, unfortunately. Wasn't sure. Mm -hmm. um, and in there, I hope to have some links to various ones. I know I will link the Battlestar Galactica and the Wire. I looked back at my old article. I had a couple other ones, but they supposedly are broken, so I need to check it. Mm. Including, if I can grab it, the original Star Trek Bible. I would like to uh, 
make the final comment that as writers, mm -hmm. our job is to immerse the reader or the viewer in our world, in our story. We are taking them on an adventure, an experience, an emotional experience. And in order to do that, we have to keep them immersed in the world we created for them, in the story we created for them. When you do not, when you break continuity, when you contradict yourself and those contradictions are not explained, you take the reader or the viewer out of the world you've created and out of the experience, they're shunted back into their own bodies and it's disorienting. And then you have to work twice as hard to put them back in. Mm -hmm. sure. So mm -hmm. a series Bible, a story Bible, is one way of making sure that you keep your continuity accurate so you don't throw them out of the experience. It's as much to help you as it is the reader. And that's why they're important. And on that note, this episode's going to end. Have a great week writing and catch you next week for yet another interesting topic in the writing industry. The new theme songs for Right Pack Radio were written and performed by Meredith Tate. All copyrights remain with her. With an emphasis on fine literature for adults and children and the most comprehensive selection of St. Louis books available anywhere. Visit them online at stlbooks.com or in person at 100 West Jefferson Avenue, Kirkwood, Missouri, 63122. Tune in next week as the Right Pack will conquer yet another pondering issue in the writing industry.